to start by telling the date and yeah, giving an idea. Yeah, can you do that ID. again? Sure. We are recording whenever you're ready. Okay. It's January 6, 2005, about 3.30 in the afternoon. We're doing the fourth and sadly last interview with um, Robert F. Goheen in his home in Princeton. Sounds good. Okay. Um, it's been a good conversation, albeit now stretched uh, <laughs> from our last one. Oh, I've enjoyed it. Yeah. Uh, I have too. This has been good. Um, we last left off um, sort of getting to the late 1960s uh, in your tenure as president. Mm -hmm. And I want to ask you a little bit about CPUC. And can you tell me just how the concept of the of CPUC the um, came about? Yeah, came about. Yes. I, I, that's interesting. I don't know it is CPUC. I know it's a CPUC. <laughs> CPUC. Uh, well, to lean into this, uh, looking backwards, I realized that the, my first decade from. 57 to 67 it was a wonderfully calm time on the campus, a time of growth and movement and, and uh, positive change. And we didn't really have much action from the uh, radical right. To, uh, uh, and it began in 67, but, but it didn't command much student support. But by 68, the Vietnam War uh, had become so traumatic for students that a lot of support was going to these quite radical young people who wanted to destroy the university and everything else and start afresh. So I guess it was in the, must have been in the fall of 67, 68, that uh, in one demonstration in front of Nassau Hall, uh, I was challenged by the uh, radicals uh, about my leadership at the university and students and faculty not having a proper voice and so on. And I said I'd always wanted students and faculty to uh, be involved in university affairs. The trouble was to get them interested in them. Uh, but anyhow, uh, I said, sure, we'd appoint a committee to look into this problem, and uh, Bill Bowen was the person who fingered Stan Kelly to head this committee, and uh, it was a committee composed of faculty members, undergraduates, graduate students, and Representative staff. Uh, not many representative staff, but some. And uh, they went to work, and and developed this really splendid document uh, setting up a somewhat new government structure for the university in which uh, faculty, students, and staff were much more involved in all kinds of issues of governance and, uh, 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 and action. Uh, that, I think, was accepted by the that their report was ex accepted by the faculty, I think, in the spring of 68. Uh, so, in a sense, we were ready to go with this new mechanism when uh, our trouble started to become more <laughs> intensive in the next two years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that proved very useful. Uh, I might say that the SDS members who were on that committee uh, withdrew after uh, not a very long time because they found they couldn't uh, dis really turn Stan Kelly off course and uh, they couldn't radicalize the report that they would like to see written. Uh, well, uh, uh, the committee went forward and, and developed its report with its uh, various uh, elements of this PUC, uh, dealing with with discipline and community affairs and uh, budget and priorities and so on, mm -hmm. as a very very important and, and worthwhile document. And I, I I I think we were very lucky to uh, have everything work out that way, and it was a, a great strength to us in the next years, as we went into the hickle heckling and then Cambodia and like that, 
to have this mechanism uh, for faculty student involvement. Uh, it was not in itself enough in in seventy after the Cambodia incursion. Uh, I guess everybody knows what that means. The president sending troops into Cambodia. Uh, there was uh, nearly a frenzy on the on the campus, and in that month of May, my we had two general assemblies in Jadwin Hall, uh, where everybody from the university and community were invited to come and sound off. And I think there was just a healthy airing of frustration and anger and so on. No action developed on those things. But we also had 10, I think in May, 10 faculty meetings. And that, that was quite quite wonderful because the the, Prince, the core of the Princeton faculty really rallied around and took all of this seriously and was a, a group uh, I could work with. I mean, they didn't completely agree with some of them didn't agree with me at all, but by, by and large, the faculty and I were on the same wavelength, and there was a terrific strengthening of my hand in this whole situation. How do you think the university would have been different if the CPUC had not been created? Well, we would have uh, probably stumbled through those events and got, got back to normal because uh, The climate of the campus changed radically for the better to a more peaceful uh, mode in the fall of 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 seventy uh, for reasons I don't fully understand, uh, and that probably would have had happened anyhow. Whether they been, but I think this, I think the university is better governed, better directed with the CUPC, CPUC, than without it. I mean, I really think involvement of, of the community, university community and university affairs is a good thing. You know, in the, in the early 60s, when universities were in this boom period we've talked about, the last thing faculty members wanted was to have the administration bothering them to get into administration. And the last thing students wanted was the deans and the rest of us telling them what to do. And so the administration had to take all these, all the whole burden on itself there, until suddenly that proved very inadequate as the troubles, uh, as the social concerns of society came to bear on the university in 60, 67, 68, 69, 70. Uh, you know, I, I think with great sympathy about Grayson Kirk at, at Columbia, who was uh, criticized so radically by his students and faculty for uh, uh, being remote and distant. Well, that's where they'd want him to be. You know, they, until 66 or 7, they didn't want him interfering in their affairs or calling on them to do anything. It was just a great shift in climate. Mm. You mentioned the SDS and their withdrawal. What do you think their agenda was? Oh, they were they were uh, they were social radicals. Uh, I I can't remember the name of their their manifesto, which had been written in the early '60s, uh, in which, in effect, they have a highly utopian vision of a society where everybody does things willingly and cooperatively, and you, you don't need these repressive forces and so on. And uh, even though they became among the, the most repressive force themselves, you know. Can you talk about other significant changes or things that you think were significant changes in university governance uh, during the in later governance? part of the tenure? Huh. Well, as the university uh, grew, uh, the administration grew, and uh, that, bo that, that bothered me and bothered some of my faculty friends, but uh, it's really inevitable when you have a, a lot more 
balls to keep in the air, you got to have more people trying to handle the situation. Mm -hmm. And of course, that growth in the administration has continued uh, as the faculty and student body has grown and as, as research opportunities have grown and developed. I want to talk a little more about Vietnam. Can we start by um, first you telling me your perspective on the war, say circa 1964-65, and how it may have changed? Uh, my, my own perspective was a very Kennedy-esque one, I, would, I guess. Uh, or even before that, Eisenhower. I, I, I thought we did the right thing when we intervened in Korea, when we sent troops into Korea to stop the communists uh, who were threatening to take over the world as we saw it. I initially thought Kennedy was right in intervening in Vietnam. Uh, that conviction didn't last very long as I saw what a, uh, how, how really ill-adapted we were to be able to do anything worthwhile down there. And uh, I went from being a quiet proponent of that war to being a very quite outspoken op opponent of it. Uh, it was just a very bad piece of judgment on the part of our government, such as we recently experienced again. <laughs> what changed your mind? How did you go from being a well? Quiet I, I started. To, I started to study, read up about Vietnam, and talk to people who knew something about it. And uh, uh, and and, re and read the news and and uh, see the kind of struggle that was going on. And, and it seemed to me to be a, uh, we ha we had very very feeble, untrustworthy leadership on the Vietnamese side we were dealing with. It was mm. just bad news from the beginning. Mm. And uh, then as more and more of our own troops got killed, of course, it became, became a, tr a tragic situation. Do you have a sense of what year you would have started to become an opponent? And I'll tell you why once you answer. Well, I, I, <laughs> would, I would think by about about 67 or 8, yeah. Okay. Do you know about the parade in uh, Washington, D.C. against the war, circa yeah. 1966, yeah. Yeah. when the Princeton students carried the banner yeah. that says, even Princeton? Where was your thinking when you, uh, when you saw that? I probably said, bravo to you, but I'm not a marcher. I <laughs> I've never marched. <laughs> Uh, and from your perspective, what about the faculty and their views on the war? It, it's hard to generalize. The faculty sure. had people with all kinds of views on the mm -hmm. war, from strong proponents like Johnny Wheeler and Vigner, and very distinguished people like that, to uh, people who are vehemently against it, like Harold Kuhn and Stan Kelly and and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I probably moved sort of in general with the faculty, not 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 in the sense of leading them or following them, but we just sort of were changing at the same time. Right. Right. Did you have a sense of the student body's view and how it may have been? Oh sure. Uh, and again, you had. Uh, uh, the efforts of the SDS to to ban military recruiting on the campus, and uh, uh, the reactionary, not reactionary, the, the counter activity of the ROTC students trying to assert the rightfulness of their presence and so on. And there was quite a, a wide debate about whether the ROTC should be here during that period. Uh, and as far as about custom, I, 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 I tried to pick the brains of every student I got a chance to talk with about 
what he feel about these issues. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, often it was very, very diverse and very muddled. But, but uh, the antipathy toward the war got certainly stronger and stronger over those years. Right, right. You mentioned the strike earlier, um, the, the, the campus strike in 1970. Yeah. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about how you viewed those events? Oh, it hits very close to heart. I mean, an anecdotal again. It, ha it happened to be this night, the university was receiving a bunch of, of I guess, distinguished uh, uh, Russian scientists here, and I put on a dinner for them in, in Prospect. And uh, toward the end of the evening in Prospect, word came that the, this uh, incursion into Cambodia had occurred. And uh, uh, immediately followed by all kinds of uh, noise in the, of people ra rallying uh, people to come to the chapel for a demonstration. Well, I had that at that initial point, I had no idea it was going to, what kind of demonstration it was going to be, but I asked the Russians if they wanted to go and they thought they'd be interested. And you were still uh, living in Prospect at yeah. this time as well, is that right? So we, we went over and they, they, I've forgotten who their faculty leader was from our side, but they, they took the Russians to one side of the chapel and I and I guess a couple of the deans sat on the, on the west side of the chapel, about third away from the front, and it was madness. I mean, you could smell the marijuana in the air. It's the last thing you were saying. You uh, said it was madness. Yeah. Oh, it was madness, and you could smell the marijuana in the air and see uh, students who were stoned with and walking around, and, uh, you know, as though the world had sort of was their oyster, but it sort of weren't, weren't not a real thing. And I saw the Russians quietly remove themselves, and uh, I sat there and decided it certainly was not the time for anybody uh, official to try to intervene. It would just be uh, a travesty to try to do that. So I, I sat through most of it and, and uh, went out. Uh, the next morning, a lot of the students uh, felt that the university had been closed down successfully and uh, they were on strike and so on. And some of the faculty felt that way too. So it was a question of ra rallying the, the troops of both sensible students and sensible faculty and trying to bring things back together again. And that partly occasions all these many faculty meetings we had. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. With, with wonderful help from the faculty, I must say, it's terrific. The, um, the students that marched on the Institute for Defense Analysis yeah. and the, the police um, presence there, uh, there's a um, noteworthy quote of, of yours that's yeah. often used in publications about, this is not Princeton. Yeah. Um, I just want to give you the opportunity to clarify sure. for I, the record. I, I, the uh, Institute for Defense Analysis had rented a building, had built and rented a building from the university mm -hmm. on university land because a lot of their scientists were working closely with some of our engineers and scientists. And uh, it seemed at the time to me quite innocuous. Uh, it all occurred before the Vietnam War had become such an issue uh, on the campus. Uh, when this demonstration developed, and I went down, it was there really before the, the bulk, bulk, bulk of it got there, I tried to tell them this was, they were protesting against, if they were protesting against the university, the IDA was not the university. Uh, it was a, an appendage of just running space from us. Mm -hmm. They want to protest the university. I wouldn't have said this, but I would have thought, go to Nassau Hall and protest the university. <laughs> 
I think, I mean, I think for them, uh, IDA and the university were, were inseparable. They just one group of evil people up there trying to run the world. Yeah. So you were being quite literal then. When yeah, you said absolutely. This about well, yeah, mm -hmm. I was astounded at the at the interpretation given it that it wasn't the proper thing for Princetonians to do. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, in regards with the the 1970s strike, what do you think would have happened if if the administration had ignored the student body and tried to conduct business as usual? Oh, it just would have been impossible. Yeah. Uh, uh, the the uh, I guess anger and discontent were so widespread that you couldn't have possibly had most classes meet, most normal events go on. Uh, some did. I mean, some faculty just refused to change in any way, and some students went along with it. But they were, they were, they were a minority, a big minority. And I'm sorry, did you say a big minority or not a big minority? Uh, the, 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 the students the, who went along. That's the wrong way to have a big. Uh, it was a. Small minority, is what I meant. I, I just said it wrong. Excuse me. Okay. It was not very many people. Okay. On, on either of these, yeah. Okay. Uh, that was a bad, bad slip on my part. Um, so where were we? Uh, if I we... never accepted the notion that the university was closed. And we continued with procedures for. Or uh, established procedures with the faculty for uh, courses to be postponed, I mean, grades to be postponed under certain circumstances, uh, things to be made up later, things of that sort. Uh, we, we never completely closed our doors academically, and I mm -hmm. thought that was important. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think was the long-term gain or loss, if any, to the university? with the, the strike of 1970? Oh, I, I, don't, I don't think that, uh, there, uh, I think the loss was very uh, transient, and the gains were, were nil. Uh, the gains had come before that, in 68, really, with the establishment of the CPUC, which really mm -hmm. had a an important effect on how the university acted, did mm -hmm. things. Okay. That the whole era that we're talking about raised um, questions about the role of universities yeah. in society, uh, university presidents, and one of your quotes was that university presidents are not eunuchs in terms of their political views. When you became university president in 1957, did you see yourself as having a political role? No. No, but I, 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 I meant that we should be uh, entitled, like everybody else, to express our views about uh, political events, political issues, and uh, making clear that we were speaking as individuals, not as representatives of the institution. And that's a hard distinction, of course, for the public to accept. So you have to be careful about that and right. not do it too much. Right. Uh, I, I, I shocked people once, when, I guess, in my impetuousness and backing Lyndon Johnson uh, publicly. And that, that shocked somebody, not so, shocked quite a number of people. That, in 68. Uh, that I, I would do that. Was that in 1968? I think 68. Yeah. Yeah. In 64, it wouldn't have been terribly shocking. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I, I admired what he was doing with the racial issues and with education a, a lot, yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you, did you have anything in particular uh, at the end of your tenure 
as university president that you thought you could contribute to the national dialogue? I'm thinking no. in particular of your testimony before Congress. Yeah, I, I, I spoke out about the Vietnam War and uh, in that testimony and, 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 and other groupings of university presidents who are all uh, who, who are like-mindedly opposed to it. But I, I never I never saw myself as a as a political figure as a, mm -hmm. uh, trying to shape the na the nation's destiny in any mm -hmm. way. We've covered a lot of ground. Uh, I was going to shift gears unless there's something else uh, you want to well, add. Well, you you you, so you your your last comment, Dan, reminds me of a book I I read uh, I guess early last summer, uh, The Guardians written by a Yale, uh, PhD, Yale PhD historian whose name slips me. But it, it uh, deals with my generation of people coming out of Yale, like George Bundy, Bill Bundy, Elliot Richardson, uh, and number of whatnot, who, who uh, he, he called, they looked on themselves as the guardians of the best of uh, American culture and tradition, according to this young man who wrote the book. And I thought to myself, look, Princetonians have never looked on themselves as anything more than servants rather than guardians. That's <laughs> basic difference between us. <laughs> um, shifting gears a little bit, I want to talk about the Board of Trustees. Okay. Uh, and particularly the composition and how it changed during your tenure. Um, can you tell me what role you played in that, if, if any? Well, I played a fairly active role in the changes. Uh, when I became president, I was very young, and the board was mo most of them considerably senior t to me. Over the years, I managed to, uh, with, with, without opposition from the board, bring in some younger people like Dick Huff, of, 39 and John Coburn of 36 and so on, but still was a quite, on the whole, uh, uh, aged board in the, in the 60s up to 70. Uh, it became clear to me that uh, this was not in the university's best interest to, to have a board which, in terms of age, was that much remote from the university's main clientele. And uh, I and other university presidents were worrying about this. And I picked up from uh, Alex Hurd, president of v Vanderbilt, this idea of having a member of the senior class, outgoing senior class, e elected as a trustee by the undergraduate body and the t two most recent alumni classes in order to try to d dull the effect of immediate campus politics on the, on the election. And I think on the whole that's worked very well mm -hmm. over the years. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the same time we, we uh, ch got the trustees to change uh, the rule on uh, the charter trustees. The charter trustees uh, continued to age 70 previously, once they did forever, but in the, in the tw 20s, I guess, they went to the 70 year limit. And instead of that, the trustees elected, I guess, after 68, the charter trustees would have 10 year terms, renewable once with a year's interval. Uh, just to, again to get more, 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 not more, more, more youth, more, 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 more in the membership of the board, which was uh, sort of broadly representative uh, of the uh, of uh, uh, the society in terms of age, rather than being all stacked up at the in the sixties. Mm -hmm. I think that's worked well. Who were the most helpful board members to you during your time? 
oh, without question, Har Harold Helm, class of 20, who was chairman of the executive committee through most of my presidency, Jim Oates, class of uh, 21 or two, I can't, no, I can't remember, 22, I guess. Uh, who succeeded him as, as chairman of the executive committee. It was a wonderful help. Uh, a great many. Stephen Ailes, uh, John Coburn, Dick Huff. Uh, you know, I, I didn't feel I had, a, well, with one exception, I'll not name, in my time, any trustee who, who really was a, disinterested, non-performing um, member of the board. I mean, they were very engaged and an admirable group of people from my standpoint. Not that we always agreed on things, but we, we could understand one another and work together. Without, you don't have to name a name, but who do you think um, were the, let's say, hurdles for you on the board? I mean, in how, well, there, how did it you know, there were a certain number of people with conservative views about social mores who didn't want w w women to g come into Princeton. <laughs> uh, I think that's where the difference showed up more than any other time. And uh -huh. uh, I mean, I had one one trustee family where the. The wife was all for the girls coming, and her husband, who was a trustee, was opposed. So, you know, that's just <laughs> the way life is. Everybody doesn't think the same way. <laughs> were there any issues with the board of trustees that you recall that were particularly naughty that you had to work out as a group besides coeducation? Well, all, all uh, uh, dealing with all the, uh, the turbulence. Uh, from the, as I said, 67 on was something that I had to constantly be talking with the board about or with the executive committee the board about and trying to get them to understand both its nature, what was behind it, how, uh, how wide or not widespread it was, and uh, what we should try to do about it. Uh, when I became president, there were a number of rules governing undergraduate life, which I thought were more appropriate to a boarding school than to a university. <laughs> uh, you know, they could only have women in the dormitories till such a six o'clock or something like that. They couldn't drive cars. Uh, they had to go to chapel every uh, second Sunday. And I, I was, I, I took my time addressing those issues because I, as I said, I was very young and green and these were old, senior, more conservative people by and large. But by just sort of generally going along and talking about these things, uh, we came to a point bef really before the times of turmoil where uh, those restrictions were removed. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, I think, yeah, I, I, I mean, I was pleased the way that happened, that <laughs> it, it wasn't a huge point of friction between me and the board. Yeah. Yeah. In one of the things I was reading, they summarized your presidency as having two distinct periods. The first being 57 to about 68, which was defined as years of growth. Yeah. And the, then the second being 68 through 72 being a time of what they called sweeping change activism and fiscal restraint. Uh, would you agree with that description? Or how would you tinker with it? Well, I, uh, I, I guess it's all right. It, it is important to recognize that in 68, for the first time in really my presidency, we began to come up really short on, on, uh, on, on money to, to to, to cover the growth we've been going through. And so we had to draw in our belts f financially, uh, and that was important. Uh, and uh, 
we were doing that as a difficult exercise at the same time that we're trying to deal with all of this unrest and get girls on the campus. It was a, it was a good challenging period. Right? <laughs> you know. Now, in your decision to retire, how much consideration did you give to these problems of the university that you were facing? Well, I, I had uh, said to various people with whom I'm close that I thought the university presidency should not run much more than 10 years. Uh, as we've just been saying, at the end of, near the end of my 10th year, we had the rising problem of, uh, of student unrest and a uh, budget crunch. And clearly, I couldn't walk away leaving those things to my successor. By 71, uh, we really broken the back, or we hadn't broken the, the we, we'd solved the budgetary problem sufficiently well, and the students had calmed down. So then I could go to the board and say, I've done 15 years, I will have done 15 years. And, I think that's long enough. And any large, almost any large successful organization except AIG, uh, board members and, and presidents turn over. And uh, uh, new, new leadership comes in with fresh ideas and fresh energy. And that's important to a university just as it is to a corporation, I think. In either a specific or a broad sense, what do you think were your most important decisions that you made as university president? Well, clearly the, the, the two most important ones had to do with diver, d diversity, uh, pushing the effort to get more uh, blacks and other minorities into the uh, university uh, body, whether it be student body or faculty, and then the women. Uh, I think both of those uh, changed the character of Princeton for the better. And th I could, those are the things I'd be most proud of, I think, yeah. What do you think are the really important things a university president should do? <laughs> and conversely, ought not to do? Oh, I can't answer that. He's got to. <laughs> he's got to keep his cool, and and uh, be a leader who who shows confidence even when he may not completely feel it. Uh, and not be afraid to take on opposition. Those are good well, things. What he should not do is, is, is spend most of his year in Florida or something. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, I think it's very important for a university or or a good liberal arts college that the uh, president. Uh, either himself embody the academic values of the institution through his own work as a scholar, or, or that he is so sympathetic to them and understanding of them that uh, the faculty accept him as one of themselves. So that you're not working administration against faculty, but you're, you're really uh, wor working in tandem together. This one might be hard for you. Um, what do you think were the sacrifices that you made uh, being Princeton's president and the sacrifices your family may have made? I, I don't think I made any sacrifices. I mean, I, I, I gave up being a, a scholar, which I had enjoyed, but I, I enjoyed much more the satisfaction of leading a great institution like Princeton, despite its headaches. Uh, 
I think life was often difficult for my wife because here we were raising this large family uh, and I couldn't be much help on that because I was so tied up in university activities and preoccupied with university problems. And I feel badly about that. Uh, but somehow we weathered it all and we're going to be 20 of us gathering together this weekend, which shows that we're still a close family, anyhow. <laughs> Do you have any hopes of what your legacy will be? I don't know what my legacy is, but I, I might say that I, I uh, was able to start a process of change in the university, uh, creative change, which has been carried forward by each one of my successors. And I hope that will, uh, I don't know if that's a legacy or not, but anyhow, it's, it's very gratifying to see that the university has not stopped and said, now we've, you know, we, we've done it, we're there, uh, let's just continue to do what we're doing. Uh, we, we, we've solved the riddle of life, you know. <laughs> Can you tell me how you um, moved on to the Council on Foundations? Well, when I, uh, uh, when my impending retirement as president was announced, uh, I, I, had, I did not go out looking for jobs. I was approached by a number of uh, different institutions uh, to come either come be a professor or jo join the administration, do various things. <coughs> and the thing that most appealed to me was an approach from the Council on Foundations in New York to head it at a very uh, difficult time it was facing, and a very important time uh, for the foundation world. Uh, in the, the mid-60s on, philanthropic foundations had come up against a, a strong uh, stream of, of popular sentiment in, in Congress, uh, which uh, said, in effect, you know, why should these rich people have a right to designate what the future use of their wealth is going to be? Uh, and uh, they were armed in that partly by being able to point to various cases where people were not using, not leaving their wealth to the public benefit, but really to private uh, interests, their, their own interests, family interests. So, uh, you know, the future of the great philanthropic foundations was, was, was being threatened. And the challenge put to me was, on the one hand, to go work with the Congress and try to convince them that on the whole, the philanthropic foundations are doing a lot more good than they were harm. Mm -hmm. At the same time, to get out in the foundation community widely uh, with my associates and try to say to the foundations that were not behaving well, look, you've got to shape up or you're going to sink the whole boat. <laughs> and uh, sometimes that worked and sometimes it didn't. But the council has, since my time, uh, grown substantially and is a really quite uh, uh, quite quite powerful and effective force today, working with these same problems. Do you still follow uh, philanthropic work closely? I, I don't follow it closely, but I, I'm a I'm a nominal member of a of a council. Uh, 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 it's not called a council of a committee uh, of of uh, former foundation people. Uh, which is assembled usually twice a year to know what the council is doing now, what the, how they see things. Uh, lately, I've not been able to get down to those meetings, but I read the literature and I'm, I'm in touch with those people. Mm -hmm. Some of the things I read um, allude to the, your time at the council as being a, um, a time where you weren't quite satisfied with your work. Would, would that be... Uh, characterization? Well, I think it was a frustrating period because I, I was so convinced that, found, that foundations, when they were doing their proper public service kind of activity, were a tremendously important feature of our society. 
uh, yet we were being denied, in a sense, on two fronts, by, by the own people and by the, by the Congress. And uh, we, we never really broke through that. Uh, I, I think a third thing that uh, separate that frustrated me in that job was that uh, some of the newer, younger uh, foundation people were all hit with, with innovation. Something had to be innovative and new uh, or they wouldn't touch it. <laughs> and uh, and uh, there's still something of that in many, many foundations. Uh, they, they want a uh, hands-on kind of engagement with quick de demonstrable results. And so it gets them into social action, which is a good thing, but it turns them away from supporting such things as research libraries and universities because there's no quick payoff right. there. And I worry that many foundations don't think about the significance of these endowed institutions, again, to the general society and the quality of the intellectual life in our country. Switching gears to India, uh, do you know how your name was put forward to be ambassador? Well, I, I think I, I, I know. I go back, as you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a missionary kid. I was born in India. I li lived most of my first 15, 14 years in India. I had been back to India quite a number of times from the time I became president until the time uh, I was approached about being ambassador. And, and various of my friends knew that, friends who ended up in influential places. One was Cyrus Vance, the Secretary of State. Uh, another was Anne Martindale from Princeton, who was uh, active in the Democratic Party. Uh, a third was Dean Rusk, with whom I had served during the war. And so I had uh, quite, to me, unexpectedly, suddenly found myself being invited to take on this job. I thought to be an ambassador, you had to either be very very rich or a very active member of the, of the political party if you're president. I was neither rich nor was I a political partisan, so it was a, a nice shock to <laughs> be, be invited just to, in the sense just for me because I knew something about the country and knew people there. You know? You'd mentioned that you'd gone to India over the years during your presidency. Yeah. What drew you there? Well, uh, Rockefeller Foundation first, and then Ford, um, misguided enough to think I could help them in developing some of their programs, developing and, and, and guiding some of their programs dealing with higher education and research in India. And so I guess for that 15 years, I probably went to India seven or eight times under the auspices of one or both of those foundations. And I'd been a trustee of the Rockefeller Foundation before, so that was quite natural. Mm -hmm. As ambassador, uh, what do you think were your accomplishments or what were the high points for you? Well, I think for the first three years of my ambassadorship, I, 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 I made uh, some progress in, in improving government-to-government uh, -government relations and understanding between our country and theirs. And that was helped, of course, in great measure because I was working for a president who was very internationally minded, Jimmy Carter, and who also had a, a particular interest in India because his mother had served there in the Peace Corps and it had been a great experience for her. Uh, when the Russians invaded Afghanistan, in what would have been uh, 79, December 79, uh, or maybe 78, uh, all that changed. I mean, the president's attitude re really changed. He felt the Russians had, had uh, misled him, had, had under, undercut him, and uh, uh, his whole focus, as you remember, even canceled our participation in the Olympic Games. Mm -hmm. We're doing things that would show our dislike and distrust of the Russians. Uh, in the subcontinent, it meant 
renewed American interest in Pakistan and providing arms for Pakistan as a frontline state against Russians in, in Afghanistan. Well, for the Indians, that was just, you know, that was a red flag in front of a bull that just turned them off totally. And, and uh, I could do all the talking in the world with, with friends and enemies <laughs> there <laughs> and absolutely accomplished nothing because of this notion that America had tilted toward Pakistan. Given your continuing interest uh, in India, what advice would you give to those responsible today for U.S.-Indian relations? Well, it's, uh, it's really quite wonderful that the last two administrations, in a sense just through the force of history, have come to realize that this in enormous democracy is also a potent uh, economic player in the world and strategically occupies a very important place in the, on the south flank of, of, of Asia. And so both the Clinton administration and now the, the Bush administration, in a sense, are going out of their way to be uh, as friendly toward India as, uh, as, uh, as possible. Pakistan remains a problem for them, but we keep trying to assure the, the I mean, the administration keeps trying to assure India that our support of Pakistan is tactical, has to do with Afghanistan and the Taliban. Uh, it's not a question of, of, of rating Pakistan as equal to Indian importance or not. But it remains an irritant, there's no doubt about it. <laughs> well, we've covered a lot of ground. Yeah. And um, I just want to ask if there's anything on your mind that we haven't discussed that you want to record for posterity? About anything at all? I, I don't think so. You've drawn me out very well, Dan. And, <laughs> and uh, uh, we, we've talked now for four hours, and right. I think I've spilled all the beans, as they <laughs> say. <laughs> well, I just want to thank you because this has been very enjoyable for me. Well, uh, and it's been really uh, a pleasure and an honor to get to know you yeah. beyond just the documents that I've been uh, holding and maintaining for these well, years. Well, well thank you. So, thank you.